The doctors said it was much worse than they thought. Cancer had spread through my body, which would require massive amounts of radiation and chemotherapy. Hi, I'm Pastor Frank of Real Life Church, and that was a prognosis before prayer. These same doctors, just three days later, declared me cancer-free and said it was a remarkable turnaround. Jesus had healed me. That was seven years ago, and today I'm still healed, cancer-free, and going strong. I've given my testimony around the world, and the message has not changed. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I invite you to Real Life Church, where you'll experience the power of God, the power of His Word, and the power of His Holy Spirit. In the meantime, enjoy today's message from one of our recent services. As you listen, God will change your life. this word I will grow by this word I will triumph in this word is my future this word is real life in Jesus name amen and if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1 but I'll warn you ahead of time we're not going to get there until the very end of the service today's teaching is entitled endangered species endangered species anybody who studies prehistory or uh, uh, any 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 of the ancient, ancient, before uh, archaeology, you'll know that there are several, I'm going to just mention a few creatures that were right here, right here in, in South Carolina, right here in the Washington, D.C. area, right here on the East Coast. There was the Elemosaur, 46 feet long, 2.2 tons, with razor sharp teeth and a uh, neck 24 feet long. Unbelievable, could just, it had a small mouth, but razor sharp teeth and it swam in the waters around here. We were underwater at that time, then it was alive, swam all around here. Then on the land though, there was the dire wolf. The dire wolf was larger than a regular wolf today, but it had massive jaws and teeth that could crush bone, called the dire wolf. Back in the water, there was a megalodon. This was a 60 foot shark that weighed 100 tons. Talk about a great white, this was bigger than that. Its teeth were half a foot long. Its bite was 10 times stronger than a great white. And it's been calculated that the Megalodon could actually bite in half the Golden Gate Bridge. Big fish. Nobody I'd want to meet. Then there was the saber-toothed cat. They used to call him when I was a kid the saber-toothed tiger. Now they call him the saber-toothed cat. There was, there was a couple of varieties. One was a saber-toothed, one was a saw-toothed. Anyway, they were um, as... Uh, as large as bears, they had two, we call them canines, even though they were, they were in cats, two, two tusks or teeth that were two feet long. And they were serrated edges on both sides, front and back. And uh, they were sharp, they were razor sharp, and they could not only tear through flesh, but also crush bone. There was an interesting thing, I'm gonna try to say its name, Amphicinidae or commonly known as the bear dog. This was a dog that was the size of a bear. And it, uh, it had slashing teeth like a wolf. It had claws like a lion. And it was, it was the top of, its, uh, of the primate list at the time. And lastly, there was the mammoth. The mammoth was different from the uh, mastodon. The mast they were both elephant-like creatures, but the mammoth was bigger. 13 feet tall. It has tusks four feet long and it ate two tons of vegetation every day. Ate two tons, can you imagine? Who, who of you would like to cook a two-ton meal? For a family of six, that's 12 tons of food. Anyway, the thing that they all have in common is that they are all extinct. None of them exist anymore. We have their bones, we have their remains, we have a lot of bones for these animals, a lot. It's not that we just found one or partial and reconstructed. We have entire skeletons for these, these animals. Tremendous animals from our history of this planet. And I want to read to you some statistics now about fathers because I believe fathers are becoming an endangered species today and are becoming extinct. Margaret Mead, who was a sociologist um, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, said this, fathers are biological necessities, but social accidents. Fathers are biological necessities, but social accidents. And the entire generation since then 
is being spoon-fed this lie. Now, young men who grow up in homes without fathers are twice as likely to end up in jail as those who come from traditional two-parent families. Now, as I read the statistics, I want to commend our single mothers. I think of Laverne, who has done a tremendous job with her children. So these statistics are for people who don't know Jesus. This is the world, but this is how it is in the world. 50%, they're tw- more than 50%, twice as likely, twice as likely to end up in jail. And I heard a, something on the radio the other day, because I told you uh, they're, they're mocking fatherhood on the local talk station, and they, they gave this example that one year a prison, I don't remember where the prison was, they decided that on Mother's Day they were going to give free phone calls to call your mom. And it was so successful, they had lines all day long, hour-long lines for all the men who wanted to call their moms. They decided to do it again for Father's Day. Not a single one showed up. Well, that's not because they don't have any, they have great disregard for their fathers. It's that they grew up in homes without fathers. They don't know their fathers. You would have thought the prison would have figured that out ahead of time. Suicide. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders are from fatherless homes. 85%. 71% of all high school dropouts, fatherless homes. Kids living in single parent homes or in step family homes report lower educational expectations on the part of their parents. 70% of juveniles in state juvenile facilities and institutions are from fatherless homes. Now, are you picking up on these statistics? 70%, 71%, 85%, 63%. Boys who grow up in father-absent homes are more likely than those in father-present homes to have trouble establishing appropriate sex roles and gender identities. You're telling me it's okay to have two mommies and no father in a home? I don't think so. Children are almost twice as many high achievers when they come from a two-parent home as from a one-parent home. Twice as many are high achievers. Only 13% of juvenile delinquents come from families in which the biological mother and father are married to each other. By contrast, 33% have parents who are either divorced or separated. 44% have parents who were never married. And lastly, criminal activity. The likelihood that a young male will engage in criminal activity doubles if he's raised without a father, triples if he's raised without a father and lives in a neighborhood with a high concentration of single parent families. Okay, so we have extinction going on. We have fathers becoming extinct. And yet Hollywood portrays fathers as dolts, idiots, deluded, slow, Fat, beer drinking, porno addicted, foul mouth, unable to survive, mess ups, klutzes to be pitied by the rest of us in society. While they, in contrast, portray women and homosexuals as sleek, savvy, knowledgeable, able, funny, capable, intelligent, fashionable, cool, enviable role models. The heroes portrayed in Hollywood are all single. James Bond, for example, Batman, Superman. And I don't know what, that's the best I could do because I don't know who any, any other heroes. I don't watch Hollywood movies. Recently, a poll was taken for the most admired fathers. Out of the top three, two are cartoon characters. Number one came in at Homer Simpson, Number three came in, whatever the guy's name is, Family Guy. Now, I can stand in front of you and proudly, I mean absolutely proudly, tell you I have never, ever watched a single Homer Simpson program or Family Guy program, ever. It's not because I'm so spiritual. It's because I think it's a little ridiculous for adults to watch animated cartoons. The kids all the time, when they were younger, would want me to watch something with them. I, you know, I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I said, you watch it and tell me about it. I'll watch different things with them. Sometimes I'll watch some, some Russian animation with them for the Russian language. 
But I just, I, you know, Homer Simpson? Really? Do adults watch that? I mean, apparently so. This is the most admired father in America, Homer Simpson. The third most admired father in America, whoever this guy is in Family Guy. I find that very telling, that two out of the three top fathers in America don't exist. They're cartoon characters. They're drawn with somebody's pencil and pen. They're not real. They're phony. They're fake. They're make-believe. And yet America believes they're the best role models for fathers. That absolutely speaks to me of the mindset, the intelligence level, the, the quotient, the IQ of Hollywood and America. Now, I'm not trying to pull any kind of intellectualism on you today, but I am telling you that this is the dumbing down, the stupidity of America. And I'm sorry if I'm tromping on you because you love those programs, but I would suggest you open a book. First, the Bible, and then some other good book. Or get some kind of a lesson that you can learn and advance beyond the comic book level if we are going to be who God has called us to be. Because he's not called us to be comic relief. He's called us to be leaders. Now, God is referred to as Father, and that's why I believe the world is trying to denigrate fatherhood. Because the Lord, from both Old and New Testament, is referred to as Father. Jesus referred to him incessantly as my Father, our Heavenly Father. The Father above, I and my Father are one. Whatsoever you ask the Father. He's constantly referring to that relationship as Father, establishing the fatherhood of God. And I believe that's one reason that the world is so bent on destroying the institution of fatherhood. Destroying it by movies and television, destroying it by making it okay for fathers to leave, destroying it, I believe the government has a hand in it, by paying out to families without fathers. You know, it's, in, in, before welfare was changed years ago, and it's gotten back to it today, I mean, we went through a, a period where there was welfare reform, and I want to admit it was both Democrat and Republican. It started during the, uh, during the Reagan and went in, and, and President Clinton did the same. There was welfare reform, and they, they called it workfare. So, because it was quickly learned that if you had more babies and had no men in the house, just had more babies, you'd get more money. And it's getting back to that today. And we need to put a stop to that because that encourages fatherless families, economically encourages, and also, I must add, maintains a voting block because you're definitely going to vote to the one that gives you the most money. This is socially unacceptable, spiritually irreparable if we don't do something about it. I believe, again, it's because God is referred to as Father. He's the source of life, as God being the Father is the source of life. He's the source of wisdom. He's the source of good. He's the source of help. He's the source of protection. He's the source of provision, and he's the source of love. Now, someone who negates that about themselves and just goes around making babies and not taking any responsibility negates love, negates provision, negates protection, negates help, negates good, negates wisdom, negates life. Just does their own thing. It absolutely exemplifies selfishness and exemplifies all the things that God is not. Now, Abraham is called the father of faith. And we're, we're, we're told to walk like Abraham walked, walk like Jesus walked, but Abraham gives us an example of someone who yearned to be a father. He prayed to be a father. Why is it that so many of the biblical characters, it's the desire of their heart to be a father, the desire of their heart to bring life into the world, to sustain life, to watch over life, to train life, to encourage life, to guide life, and to guide them into being like themselves, fearing God, living for God, serving God, listening to God, 
having a relationship with God. Abraham, the hardest thing he ever had to do was when he was told to take his son, his only son, though he had two, only one counted in the eyes of God. And that was Isaac, the son of promise, and put him on that altar. This was the test of Abraham. God wanted to know, do you trust me enough with your son? Apparently people today don't trust God with their sons because they don't bring them into relationship with God. They don't bring them into a church. They don't bring them into faith. They don't trust God with their sons. And this is what the world is teaching. Because, of course, fathers are dolts and idiots, the butt of jokes. Fathers can't be trusted to do anything right, according to television. It's the mother who knows everything. It's the mother who straightens out everything. It's the mother who can do everything. Or the homosexual. That's the cool one. We want to be like him. He has all the answers. He has all, all the savvy responses. He knows what's really going on. The other fathers sit at home drinking beer, watching TV. Probably the Simpsons. Psalm 68, 5 says that God is a father to the fatherless. If fatherhood is not important, why do we need to have a father to the fatherless? Why don't they just be fatherless? But God steps into that role to be a father to the fatherless. That's how important it is that no one go without a father. So fathers step up to be the godly men in lives that shape and mold and guide them. It's natural for children to rebel. I don't know, I don't have my phone on, but that sounds like a phone interfering with... Pardon? It's a speaker? It's a phone interfering with the speaker. I don't have my phone. That's what I'm saying. If I had my phone near my microphone, that would, that would do it. But I don't have a phone on, so it's not me. So everybody, turn off your phones. This is your pilot speaking. We're about to take off. Please disable all of your electronic devices. I don't think that does anything, but anyway, you know, it probably doesn't interfere with the guidance system, but it interferes with them. So they can't listen to, you know, music or whatever they're doing when they're flying. So, uh, Fatherhood is not something that we can permit to become extinct. Fatherhood is not something that we can allow our culture to dictate. Uh, yes, today our culture, what does our culture do? Our cult I have another quote for you, from, it's here somewhere. Our culture says that it's okay for men to marry men. I guess that means we have double the fathers, right? Now, I don't think so, because in those situations, they're, they're both a little less than a father, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, thank God for the iron in the blood of our fathers. Thank God for the iron in the blood of our fathers. We need fathers with iron in their veins again. And I'm not, how many of you remember the old, uh, was it Ed Sullivan or something that had Geritol that was the, anybody remember Geritol? What, what was that for, Ed Sullivan? Lawrence Welk? Geritol, was Geritol with Lawrence Welk? All I remember was Geritol was for iron poor blood. So I guess we'll get some spiritual Geritol in here. So we get some iron in our blood. You know, men, it's time to be men. men when you're men, your kids are serving with you. When you're men, your kids are serving in the church. You know, I, I delight to have our young people serving in the church. That is such a blessing. Our, we, all four of our kids... Three of our kids are on the cleaning crew. One of our kids is the head usher. Two of our kids are on camera. And they're, they're, they're looking for other things to do in the church. This is a respect for fatherhood and a respect for the fatherhood of God. We want to get all of our kids involved in the church. Get all of our kids serving in the church. As respecting their fathers and as respecting God as our father. Psalm, uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 4, number 1 says, Obey the instructions of a father. Obey the instructions of a father. Well, for there to be an obedience, the father's got to give instructions. Right? Without, without instruction, there's no obedience. And many times fathers aren't sure. Because society has taken that away and put in doubt, self-doubt into them. It has become so commonplace for fathers to doubt that they're right. To doubt that, they're, that they have a valid opinion, to doubt that they may know what to do. 
And so many times they defer to somebody else. It's time for fathers to make a decision, right or wrong, and live with it. And if you've chosen wrong, then to repent and choose the right. But fathers have to have iron in their veins. I think of uh, last week as we were talking about the Normandy invasion, the, fa the, the fathers that went and laid their lives down. The people that took up the cause and did what they needed to do to keep our country free. Well, our country is no longer free. Our country is in bondage. Our country is going down the tubes, and it's because, not because of Republican, not because of Democrat, it's because of family and the assault on the family. And because families have become fragmented, broken up, broken apart, and because fathers are no longer filled with the iron in their veins, that our society as a whole and our culture is deteriorating. As fathers become extinct, the culture and the nation will fall. You might say, isn't that a little bit of an overreaction? Absolutely not. We've had years of eroding of the authority of the father, years of eroding of the place of the father, and it's time for the fathers to kick back. I don't mean kick back on your sofa. I mean fight back, kick back, stand, and say enough, no more. Now we're not talking about, and this is what we were, we were discussing this a little bit earlier today in our house, how if a strong woman who may be of a conservative bent comes on the national platform, they are ridiculed, mocked, made to look like idiots, made to look like they're just so stupid and they know nothing and that follows them, they're stigmatized by our press and it follows them around for years, but yet, if an incompetent female is put into a position and you're, they're criticized because of their, that they're incompetent, oh, you just want to keep your women barefoot and pregnant, cooking your supper. Why is that? It goes beyond, and you, know, you can get into a whole political thing, it goes beyond Republican and Democrat. It goes to the very heart of the assault on the family. And nobody is going to stand up for the family except us. We're the only ones. Yes, we're the ones that are backward. We're the ones that are, you know, we're, we're riding around in our pickup trucks with a shotgun in the back. And our baseball cap turned sideways or whatever. But yet we, we right here, where we live, right here, what we believe, right here in the church, we are the only ones this country can depend on for its salvation. Because we are the ones that need to say no more. We're not going to believe that lie. We're not going to let our families go down the tubes. We are standing for God. We are standing for family. We are standing for country. It starts here. If it doesn't start here, it's all over already. We've, we, we must see that we have a responsibility to keep this one nation under God. That we serve God as our Heavenly Father by being earthly fathers. Now I said we were going to go to Hebrews, so I'm going to go there now. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times in a diverse manner spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's just meaning those who came before us, not our, necessarily our physical fathers, but it's noteworthy to mention that we call great men fathers. Our forefathers. He spoke to the fathers. Fathers of the faith. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, which he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. All right, a lot of King James words and language, but basically you boil that down to this. God spoke to our fathers, and then he sent his own son in his own image, in his own likeness. You see, Jesus is great because he's like God our Father. When our sons are like us, they become great when we are like God. And it's our responsibility to mold and shape our sons and our daughters to be in the image of God, to be men and women that can be counted on, faithful. When they give their word, they're there, honest not doing things behind people's back, 
trustworthy. You can give them a job and they'll take care of that job. People who know the value of faith not ridicule or mock people that are praying in the Holy Ghost or people that are going beyond and doing something that may not understand at the moment. With an honest, sincere reverence for God, not an act, not a show, just while you're looking at Him, but truly love God. That's our responsibility, fathers. But we've got to display those things. And here, verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. It all, it all really comes to this. Be a father. Be a father. If you don't know how to be a father, maybe you didn't have a father. Maybe your father wasn't the best example. Be like God. Be like God, source of life, a source of wisdom, a source of good, a source of help, a source of protection, a source of provision, a source of love. Father, we pray for our fathers today. We ask your anointing to be upon them, to stand against a culture, to stand against a society, to stand against Hollywood, to stand against everything that would try to destroy and denigrate families in our present day, to stand up for righteousness, to stand up for God, holiness, to stand up for your word, to be a source of life, a source of wisdom, a source of good, a source of help, a source of protection, a source of provision, and a source of love, that children can come under their shadow and feel safe and protected, that wives can be surrounded by their arms and feel secure. Thank you, Father, that when times are hard, they withstand the brunt of the enemy. They withstand the assault of the economics. Their shoulders are big enough to bear the burden, but soft enough to cast that burden upon you in prayer. Thank you that our fathers are examples of men with iron in their veins, but hearts that are softened to hear your voice and weep in your presence. Thank you that our fathers take their place as men, directing their sons and daughters into the path of righteousness and truth and are not afraid to correct, setting an example of godliness as showing a source of power beyond their own. Thank you for prospering the work of our Father's hands, both their financial work and their family work. We lift them up to you today for your special blessing on this special day. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment, if there's anyone here who has not made a profession of faith to the Lord Jesus, he said, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Have you been born again? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Have you prayed to receive Jesus Christ? Not just in a churchy way, not a religion, but a relationship. Do you know God today as your Father? You talk to him, you hear his voice, you know his presence. If not, I'll lead in a prayer. We'll all pray together. All of us will pray out loud together. If you'd like me to pray, Take a minute right now, lift your hand, then put it right back down just to say, I want to know God as my Father on Father's Day. What a day. Just lift it up and put it right back down. Anyone that would like this special blessing in their lives, take a minute, search your hearts, lift it, and put it back down. Well, Father, we honor you as your children. Be blessed as we live for you. Be blessed as we worship you. Be blessed as we celebrate your presence in our lives. We go out to freely give your, your word away, freely give the miracles that you daily load us with, to freely give those away, the blessings, to share our faith and to stand against our society, to change our society, not to be in combat, but to change, 
to show strength and endurance, to show godliness and holiness, to show fatherhood. Thank you for empowering us, Lord, to be like Christ, that though they would laugh at him and mock him, even try to throw him off a hill, that he would walk through their midst and no one could touch him. Thank you, Father, for that anointing of power and strength, that anointing of joy. We go out to make something happen, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I lay hands on my children by faith, communicating faith, sharing faith, extending faith for these young people to be men and women of God, to walk in your word, in your will, in your way, speaking faith, living by faith, walking by faith, communicating faith, doing exploits by faith, being the leaders you've called them to be. We pray also that they and their families would be blessed, blessed in every way, but especially in their relationships, that they would honor one another, speak well one of another, and be a blessing to each other. I pray for their community, the church first, that they would each take part on a regular basis, understanding that they are the church, that they would serve in the church, lead in the church, pray for our church, stand up for our church, and freely give away our church to others. I pray for their finances, for the anointing of prosperity, for the wisdom in order to spend wisely, to save and not spend, to put some away for that day when you lead them to do a work for you. I pray that they would know the value of hard work and earned income and that they would freely give to you of their overflow, of their tithe, and of their first fruits. I pray, Father, that they would be upstanding citizens of our community, of our nation, of our state, that they would be outstanding citizens, not breaking any laws, keeping them all, and leading others to do so. And finally, I pray for their health, that no harm would come nigh them, that your arm is not shortened, they have overcome the ravages of hell and of this world of sickness and disease by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. You have declared, you've sent your word unto them and healed them and delivered them from all destruction. Let it be so from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you, everybody.